I had to think there's very few areas in life that, you know, so I'm going to use Gabe as an example. He's got semis on the road. And if I came to him today and I said, hey, Gabe, I got my CDL. Do you think I can get in the truck tomorrow and go haul the logs for you? What do you think he's going to say? Al, would you let me? Never. <laughs> Good answer, right? Arlen, would you let me work the floor tomorrow on sales down at Holmes Lumber? No. You, why? Why not? I, I need to be trained, correct? Gabe, if I had been driving for a year or two with a decent record, and I said, dude, I, I can help you out tomorrow. You, you put me on a truck. You trust me because I've got a little bit of a record. And that's how it is a lot in life with a lot of things that we as humans do and we interact with. Like, just, we feel like we need to be trained to do certain things. But in reality, in the Christian life, it's the only thing that I can really say that I know of that I can be saved today and instantly I become a witness to the world of what Christ has done in my life. Right? It's like right now, the, the, the switch is flipped, the amp is on if you want to use that analogy again. But like right now, and we know that different people have different uh, testimonies of how that worked in their lives. Uh, I look back at, at, at Paul on the way to Damascus, right? He's getting ready to like persecute Christians. He's as far away from God and from Christianity as you could possibly get. And in an instant, the light shone down, it flipped his switch in his amp, and three days later, he is out preaching. No training, so to speak. Just go do it. That's us as Christians. That's what God can do for us. That's living out the Christian life. We get saved, though, and we think we got to have everything in order because everything else in our human life, everything else is sort of trained and it, it's sort of we, we kind of practice for it or we, we get better at it or we whatever you, however you want to look at it. Everything else in life is that way except being a Christian. So when we become a Christian, the automatically we default to the thought of, well, we got to get everything right. You know what, I'll talk about God when I get this aspect of my life straightened up or when I get this certain thing cleaned up or when I get, get farther down the road, I'll, te I'll, be, I'll testify for him. And it's not the way that God designed it. It's truly not. But then we live in a culture where, hey, he was at the bar yesterday and he's out here witnessing to Christ today. Now what happens? Dave, tell me what happens. Harold, tell me what happens. The, the church people say, uh-uh, you can't do that. You didn't go through the 12 steps of whatever, whatever steps you want to call it, right? So there's tension. He can't be saved. He was just partying last weekend. And we do that. Paul's writing about that today in Romans chapter 14. And I guess as I, as I studied this, it's like, oh, the Holy Spirit just convicted me. Jimmy, you've done this. And guess what? You have done it recently. And guess what? You're going to have to work on this one. Because, man, it's easy to say, oh, oh, man, I know too much about that guy. Right? Or girl. Don't want to leave the girls out. You're not perfect. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Let, uh, he needs to prove himself. 
It's the culture we live in. It's not Christian. It's not the way God wanted it. He invites us the moment that we recognize that we are sinners and the moment that we receive in faith that Christ died for our sins. He, in that moment, invites us into the work of his kingdom, and it's an instant. And for every one of us, it's going to look just a little bit different. And my goal today, as I read this, is so that we can leave this place today, all of us giving each other space, somewhat of space, to live out our convictions and to live out what, what God is doing in our lives and that, that we on the sidelines, our neighbors, our, our, our fellow members, brothers and sisters of this congregation, that we would give ourselves a little bit of space to breathe and not to be looking down each other's noses. It goes right back to everything that Paul's been talking about all along. You get saved and God starts inviting you into his life. The Bible does never, it never puts a premium on training, but it does put a premium on availability, guys. And if you become a Christian today and you wait for three or four years before you start proclaiming that in your sphere of influence, I will tell you, Satan is going to have a heyday with you. That's how I believe. Our job is to get to it. And to influence as many people that we can of the goodness and grace of God. How often does the Bible talk about episode after episode, story after story, people of God, people that were away from God. The Bible stories are full of people who immediately, when God started to do a work in their life, they immediately went out. They didn't feel like they were ready for it. And then there's other cases where God took his time and trained them over the years. I know Moses did not feel worthy of going and and preaching to or or leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. He didn't feel worthy. He had a stutter and he he just didn't deem himself as a good leader. And so God took him to the wilderness for 40 years and got him prepared for what was coming for the next 40, right? Right? There are those cases, but God's redemptive power is one that we should embrace and realize and recognize that it is an instant that our heart changes and that the Holy Spirit comes upon us, guides our conscience into all of the things that, that are right. And we need to embrace that and witness to it. I'm not saying training is a bad thing, but if you're well-trained and you go after all of the education that you possibly can and training in a certain area, in a certain field of of, uh, expertise or professional, I will tell you that a lot of times, if things go well, you are going to be prone to take the credit for it. And in the kingdom of God, I will tell you, God isn't looking for people who will take credit for what they've done. He's looking for people who will give him credit for what he's done. I'm so thankful for the work that his spirit has done in my life. And our job as a congregation, our job as Christians, our job as individuals here is to be an amplifier of the message of Jesus in a broken world. We don't have to look far to know that we live in a broken world. Last week I used the analogy of the bass going through my subs and my amp and how it vibrated. I'm going to use that analogy again. If you can imagine this bass guitar right here as being Jesus, the bass itself being Jesus, it's not plugged in. And so as I hit those strings, you didn't hear anything. And the amplifier that puts the sound out, this is what produces the sound, this amp right here, this box. If you could use the analogy that that amp is us, it's the Christian, it's the individual Christians, and then the power source plugged into that wall right there, that power source that gives that that amplifier power would be the Holy Spirit. Can you envision that now? 
So the bass guitar is Jesus. The amplifier is us. The power that is produced into the amp is the Holy Spirit, right? It only works when you're plugged in. Somebody say amen. Where's Phil? I keep hearing him. Yeah, say amen. And the cable that hooks up between Jesus and the amp, this cable right here, is faith. It takes faith. It takes faith to believe all of that would work together to make a beautiful sound for Christ, for the kingdom of God. I'm going to talk about something that I feel is important today. We live in a day and age right now where Christianity, in my opinion, is marginalized. It's marginalized because in some ways for us believers, we've never actually grown up. Ooh, I'm talking spiritually. We become Christians. Some of you became Christians when you were young. And others of you became Christians recently, right? And in our immature thinking, the ones that have become Christians a long time ago, we default to the fact that, well, now he became a Christian, he should smell like me, he should look like me, he should act like me, he should dress like me, he should just be like me. That's immature. So I will tell you it's marginalized because of that. That's what the lens that I'm looking through when I say that Christianity is somewhat marginalized. I'm not looking at it in a negative way. It's just like when we come to know Jesus, we realize that we're saved not by what we do, but by what he's done. Amen? That's the good news. That's what Paul keeps talking about all through Romans. It was the the delivery of the good news, and he keeps coming back to it every single week. There's nothing that you and I can do to add to the salvation. There's nothing that you and I can do to subtract to the salvation. He finished the work on the cross. Amen. And when we believe that, we live our lives in light of that. And that's what comes out. That's what witnesses to people. Last week we were looking at the idea that when we do believe that, there are some people then who will take that idea that we're saved by faith without works, faith apart from works, right? Faith apart from works. They take that idea and it means to them then that they can live however they want. I'm free. I can do whatever I want. I can go wherever I want, whenever I want, with whoever I want. Do as much of it as I want. I'm here to tell you, according to Romans chapter 14, that's a flat out lie. It's not like that. How we live does not save us, but because we are saved should affect how we live. That's the point I want to drive home today. How we live does not save us, but because the fact that we're saved, we should be changing some things in the way that we live. The Lord changes the way that we live through changing our hearts. If you are in Christ, you've been set free, true. But freedom does not mean that you do whatever you want. That's what our culture says. That's what some denominations push. I get it. You do whatever you want. Because our culture says that. And see, when the culture drives that, it's my body, it's my choice, it's I'll do what I want. Then the church starts to bow to it, and all of a sudden you have that infiltrating into our churches. Amen? You understand what I'm trying to say? And then all of a sudden, now what happens? I will tell you, with those freedoms that we gain when we become Christians, those freedoms and that rights that we get, with those freedoms and rights come huge responsibility. It's not my right always. It's not my body, my choice 
always. You understand? When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, when we're connected to the Holy Spirit by faith, then our, our amplifier becomes crystal clear, and we have a responsibility to keep it that way. What Paul continues to talk about as we get into uh, this scripture, Romans chapter 14, is uh, we don't want to use our freedom in a way that would put a stumbling block in front of anyone. We talked about that last week. Or that would hurt or grieve anyone. Uh, we don't want it to hurt or our witness. We need to be very, very intentional of not hurting or marring our witness to the world. And as we read the text today, I want you to think about these questions. You can write this down. I want you to think, are we really doing this? Do we really do this? Are we thinking about these things like Paul says to? Do we really, is that the way that we live? Romans chapter 14. We're going to read 14 through 18 right now. I'm reading out of the NIV. You can join in in any uh, scripture that you have pulled up, any translation. Here we go. Romans 14, verse 14. Paul says it this way. I am convinced. <laughs> He's without the shadow of a doubt. Without the shadow of a doubt, I'm convinced. Being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing, somebody say nothing, is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person, it is unclean. Verse 15, if your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Serious? I'm not going out to eat with any of you anymore. Do not buy your, oh, then you're not acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Verse 16, therefore do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Now, Paul is jumping in right off the bat, right there in verse 14, where he says, I'm convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus. Last message, uh, last Sunday, we talked about the, the questions of conscience, what Paul would have regarded to as the questions of conscience. People use their conscience to say that this is okay or this is not okay, right? When, when, when you make a decision based on whether it's right or wrong, you're using your conscience either time. It's either, it's either really pricked when you're done or it's clear, right? It's tax season. Are your, is your conscience clear? Bad joke. The timing was awful. I'm sorry. But Paul is using this analogy just in one simple example of eating meat. He's writing this letter to the church in Rome. We talked about it a little bit last Sunday that they were eating meat that was being used. The animals were being used as a sacrifice to the Roman gods. And so then after that, I mean, it just makes sense. We live in an eco-friendly world. We would never throw those animals just away. We would take them and skin them and then we put them in the market, right? We would think that way. But you have to understand there was a group of believers inside of the very church at Rome that was Jewish in their tradition and in their culture they would never do that because that meat was sacrificed to a false god and being part taking part of that as an as digesting it consuming it it's severing our relationship with god it's sacrilegious we can't do it they, i feel like i'm sinning against god when i do it but other people were like hey we can't be wasteful i'm set free here christ died for me i'm free i can eat and i'm allowed to eat whatever i want and so inside of the church in the early church there was contention you can't eat that i can eat that and we look at it today and say well how dumb but we're no different Am I right? These were minor, temporary things that Paul is trying to say, don't get hung up on these things. 
This stuff does not matter in the kingdom of God. But you are allowing this little issue of meat, whether it's good or whether it's bad, you're allowing that to come into and steal your peace. You're allowing it to disrupt and divide and steal your joy. And it's not a righteous thing that you're doing before God. So we need to, all of the major elements of our lives as a Christian that we live out needs to bring peace, joy, and righteousness before God. That's what he's trying to bring across. I will tell you, I had to think, I mean, this is just the one that came to my mind, and I could write a thousand of them. But we're facing one right now where, and and I'm just going to be very transparent with you. We're in a culture today where same-sex marriage is now allowed and made legal in America. As far as I know, no one's sitting here that's married like that, right? But what if there was? Oh, Jimmy, I'm a homophobic. I'd be out the door. Well, good for you. Just, I'm just asking, what if there would be? What happens to us who don't believe that? All right? So now, we, as we go through, this has now been legalized, right? It's legal in America. And now some of our friends might have that way of life. They might live out that way of life. And, or their children might live out that way of life. And they ask us to come to the wedding. This side would say, oh, no. no. If you go. The Bible talks plainly about it. And if you go, you are by all means, you are condoning it. This side would say, well, now, wait a minute. The Bible also says that the greatest law of commandment to man is to love. And so you have, I can make a biblical, we can biblicize that thing on both sides, right? Making it whether you go to and attend the wedding or whether you don't. Okay, if I'm going to paint the picture, I'm going to say, well, I mean, I think, you know, maybe we should go because uh, we've been friends with them forever and our relationship's really going to be, te- you know, it's, it's going to be a strain in our relationship if we don't go. And you're over here saying, well, if you go, you're condoning to it. Do you see what happens in the church? God forbid that it happens, but guess what? We live in a broken world. Those things are real and they are happening. So how do we as a church respond to that? Open mic. Come on up. How are we going to respond to it? You're all waiting for me to say it. I'm not going to. It's not for me to say, Phil. Because... I- It is a question of conscience. I full hearted believe that. That is a question of conscience. And it is something that Satan has deployed into our world, all right, to cause the church people to fight. That I believe. And we better know what to do with those types of issues because there's not just that one. There's a, there's a thousand more. People who have strong feelings of not going, do me a huge favor. Don't go. People who are fighting for love and for fighting for on that side of the biblical case, do me a favor and go. But the last thing that you do is fight each other. It's not a war meant to fight inside the church. It's not one that's meant to be fought. Jesus hung out with tax collectors and sinners, so what's the problem? See how we land on both sides? Just... all day and then we start on the next one we don't get anywhere except divide 
We should never divide the church over something that is temporal, is temporary. But see, I go back and I say, well, Paul said that in Corinthians, okay, he said that, well, the meat, the animal that was sacrificed to the false god, <laughs> that thing was false. So it really didn't matter. Eat it if you want to. So I will ask you this. In my scripture, it tells me that a man and a woman have a covenant with God in marriage. Y'all get where I'm going? So if a man and man want to get married, hey, that's their problem. I, 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 believe me, I'm convicted about it. Me personally. That's me. I'm telling you my, my side. I am convicted about it. But in reality, I don't know that God honors that union. It's fake. It's a false god in the Roman Empire. Do you, does that make sense? That's my take. I probably shouldn't have said that. Beck, am I going to get in trouble? Email me. I don't care. That's where I stand on it. I don't believe in it. I, think it's, I don't think it's a union that God honors. So what do we do? Because of these questions of conscience is why the churches are splitting today. And it's important that we don't let those questions of conscience split us. That we stand fast to what Christ has done for us. And we stand fast to the righteousness, peace, and joy that is supplied by walking in his light. In verse 14, he does say this. He says that, that nothing is unclean of itself. He's saying that in, in the, the light or in relationship to the meat that was sacrificed to idols. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But there's so many other scriptures that will tell us how to live. And those determinations, whether it's unclean for you or unclean for another or vice versa, that has to be done by your conscience guided by the Holy Spirit. That is the full liberty in Christ. Then the second, verse, second half of verse 14 goes on this. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. That's correct. He's saying, although that I feel complete liberty to eat whatever I want, but for the person that thinks it's unclean, guess what? It is unclean. So when we go out, at, I'll never forget, oh, man, God bless her. She God rest her soul. My mother-in-law was the most generous person you ever in your life met. We went to Niagara Falls one time. We would go there every fall, and uh, there was a group, and we went to a park with a, we actually fixed sandwiches and we took him out to the park. We were going to have a picnic. And there was a group of believers, other types of believers, that were over under a certain tree and they all had the uh, wraps on and they were, the ladies were looking out of about like this. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Don't eat pork. And the only thing we had in our, in our basket was ham sandwiches. And she goes, oh, Jimmy, get a nibble and get and sandwich. See if it's season hungry. Do you know what that means? Go over there and give her a, them the sandwich. Like, give them a We've got plenty and they're hungry. I said, you don't understand. Like, we're going to offend them if we, take a, if we take a ham sandwich over there. They might cut our heads off. Like, we can't. Like, that's what I'm talking about. Like, we can't impose. We are free to eat pork. Praise God. Huh. I love it. They're not. Do you know why? Look it up. It's interesting. But now for me to have the freedom to eat it, I can't go over there and impose it like, ha, 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 here's a ham sandwich. And God bless her. She, my my mother-in-law didn't realize the laws around it, but they'd have thrown my sandwiches away. It had been a waste. And I would have imposed some type of... Uh, it would have offended them, right? So those, those are, that's just a little instance. We have so many of these in our everyday lives that we can, hey, should I, should I walk into that place when I know someone over here has a weakness of that? Should I be going there? If, if it's going to lead him astray, maybe he shouldn't know or shouldn't see me doing that. It's not that I have a problem with it, but man, I know his weakness. 
Should we go to that venue? Should we take part in this? Should we go to this place to eat? I'm just asking. If it's unclean for you and it's a thought in your mind that it might stumble your neighbor or your friend, then I will tell you that is a thought that was put in your conscience by the Holy Spirit and you better listen. Verse 15. <clears throat> if your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. <clears throat> Do not, do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. The, the principle of that verse, I will tell you, is that the law of liberty is greater than the law, or the law of love is greater than the law of liberty. Write it down. Love is greater than liberty. But we can do what we want. But if we stumble or regrieve someone through our liberty, we are not walking in love and a mature person a mature christian will realize that just because you're allowed to do it doesn't mean that it's the best thing for you to do i've learned in business just because you can do something just because you're approved for a certain amount and alone doesn't mean that you should doesn't mean you should just because you can don't mean you should that goes in all aspects of life and all the different things that we do in our lives. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. There's a greater reality than just what I'm allowed to do. And that's what I call from the South, we call it growed up. We growed up in Christ. We're mature. It's not about what I want. It's about what does pure love invite me to do. Verse 15, it says in the middle, it ends it by, do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. He's saying here, what is more important? What you're allowed to eat or what you're allowed to do or destroying the very person that Christ himself came to die for and came to redeem? If Christ has redeemed, our, our intention should be this, that if Christ has redeemed a person, or if there's a potential for Jesus to redeem a person, then I'm not going to do anything that would grieve or cause him to stumble. I mean, if you stop and think about it, why would I ruin someone's salvation or the chance for them, the opportunity for them to be saved through the choice of food? Am I that hungry that I would eat something in front of them in one meal that would offend them to the point that they would not give their hearts to Christ? I'm using that as an example. There's other things that we could be put in place of food. Maybe it's the entertainment that we take in. Maybe it's the drink that we drink. Maybe it is the food that we eat. Maybe it's the clothes that we wear. Am I going to allow those little minor temporary choices to offend someone to the point that they would not come to the knowledge of the saving grace of Christ? I'm just asking. I think we all need to get this. All of us. The church as a whole across the whole world needs to get this because of what's going on in our world. I feel the church is getting frustrated with the path that the world is on and we're not even thinking like this anymore. Why would I needlessly grieve someone? Why would I needlessly divide a church over something temporary? This has been written in here for 2,000 years. And we got it twisted a little bit. We do. We have a distorted view of it, I feel. We could do better. Let's put it that way. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, Paul says it to the church at Ephesus. He says it this way, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of what? Love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Just as Jesus has done for us, we are to be what Paul would say to the church of Ephesus now, to be imitators of him. We imitate God, because of what Jesus, of who he is, he is self-sacrificial. He gave up his life 
for you and for me. And Paul is, again, reiterating the fact that it's not what we definitely necessarily what we want to do, but it's about how can I imitate Jesus in every day that I live it out so that people can be saved, so that people can be built up, so that it brings peace, love, and joy. I would say it this way. I believe Paul, what he's trying to say there is that every single time that you have the liberty to do something and you sacrificially give it up for the benefit of someone else, that is a sacrifice to God. You're making a sacrifice for his kingdom. And every time you choose not to, I believe you're committing a sin. Because anything that we do that severs our conscience or, or, or we just do it anyway and it pricks our conscience and it's, it starts to sever our relationship with God, that in my scripture would say is a sin. And are we careful about it? When's the last time you actually thought about it like this? Have you ever thought about it like this? Is there anything in my life that I'm doing right now that could, could cause someone to stumble? Is there anything in my life, is there anything in your life that you're doing that could possibly lead someone astray? That could grieve somebody, offend someone. When you get saved... You're plugged in by faith. The amplifier's on. It's our our job to witness. Let's read verses 16 through 17. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy through the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. When you allow these questions of conscience, what Paul is saying is what you eat, what you drink, the lesser things. When you allow those to become more important than the greater things, you're missing the point is all Paul is trying to say. It's not, the kingdom of God is not about what you eat or drink and what you, what, what you, it's not about those things. It, it's about the kingdom of God. It's about the finished work of Jesus. Let's read verses 18 through 21. It says this, because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. I'm going to start back at 17 so you get it. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Verse 19, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. What does mutual edification mean? What is the... What is the definition of the word edify? It means to build up. So when it's mutual, I build you up, Dan, you build me up. Gabe, we have a back and forth relationship. I'm going to help you get through life. You're going to help me get through life. There's going to be different degrees. There's going to be areas in Gabe's life that he's way more advanced spiritually than me. And there may be other ways that I'm more advanced and we help each other through those things. That's what mutual edification means. And there's peace about it. It leads to peace. It leads to mutual edification. So we build each other up, right? Verse 20 says, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. For all food is clean. Oh, it doesn't say for all. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. He understands, Paul is saying there is nothing unclean here, there's, it's, it's all good here, there's no problems here, but do not, it is wrong for you to take part of any of those things if you know that it's offending them. That's heavy, ain't it? Paul understood that who the Son sets free, they are what? Free in what? Free indeed. He understood complete liberty. He understood it. He wrote it. But with that liberty is one of the greatest exercises that we have to do 
and that is by not destroying what God has done for us in our conscience and not, not severing our relationship with him through going against what the Holy Spirit is convicting us to do. Let me tell you, the Holy Spirit will convict. The devil will condemn. And you'll know when you cross the line. And I'm not saying you can't get back. That's the glory of being a Christian. You can say, God, I am so sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. Would you restore my relationship with you? Will Holy Spirit come back and beg him to come back and to guide you into better, bigger and better things? That's life. I have to do that. I get to do that. Amen? We get to do that. We don't have to live in condemnation. That's how I know the difference. The enemy condemns us. The Holy Spirit convicts us. There's a huge difference there. He's, he's encouraging us to push our lives, to live our lives towards a life of peace and for mutual edification. And I will tell you, the greatest exercise for me of strength and freedom is the ability to say this. I have it written down like this. Even though I'm allowed to do it, I'm not going to do it because I want the person to experience God's peace and I want to build them up and not tear them down. So in my opinion, that's the greatest exercise of strength that there is. Knowing I can but not doing it because I don't want to offend you. First Corinthians, Paul writes it this way in first Corinthians 10 verses 23 through 24. He says, I have the right to do anything. That's in quotation marks. So if you read it out of context, I don't want you to read that out of context. First Corinthians 10. He's saying that if somebody says I have the right to do anything, he's not necessarily telling us that we have the right to do anything. I mean, in freedom of Christ, we do. But here's the deal. You say, but not everything is beneficial. And then he goes again. Oh, I have the right to do anything. But not everything is constructive, Paul says. He's writing a quotation mark like that in the Bible. So he's taking what he's hearing the church at Corinth say. But we have the right to do anything. He said, yeah, but it's not all constructive. It's not all beneficial. And we need to know that. No one, he ends that verse there in 24. He says, no one should seek their own good, but the good of others. That's total freedom. When I know that I'm being an influence, a good influence in your life, and you're being an influence back, we're building each other up. Very, very much. I'm getting ready to sing. That's a good Leonard Skinner tune. <laughs> Uh-oh, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Okay, I'm going to try to go on. Jesus shows us sacrificial love. It was proven the night that he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Right? He's getting arrested. The tension is high. He's there with his disciples, some of them. Peter's there, you know the story. The tension is high. And Malchus walks up, right? Judas betrayed him. Malchus walks up to get him. And Peter's like, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Wax at him, right? I don't think he was going for his ear. I think he was going to cut his head off. Missed, cut his ear off, falls to the floor. Jesus goes, Peter, what are you doing, man? Just let this go. This is how it's supposed to be. You know that I could call for an army of angels. See, Jesus didn't have to. He, he had the ability to get out of that, right? He could, he could have got away from that. But he didn't. That's the same thing that it, the analogy that I want you to understand. Like, just because you can don't mean you should. The strongest man isn't always the one who throws the punch.
the strongest person is not always the one that screams back. But bites their tongue and walks away. The, the strongest person is not always the one that I have every right and every reason to be this way. I, I have every right and reason. You know what? I have evidence. Just because you do don't mean you should. It takes a much stronger person to just walk away. Knowing you're right, oh, it sucks, doesn't it? Sometimes. I want to prove to them that I'm right. How many looked in the mirror this morning? Come on, be honest. How many didn't? Let's get a raise of hands there. <laughs> What'd you see? What did you see? <laughs> I saw a lot of gray hair. I can't believe how old I look compared to 10 years ago. Somebody from church sent me a picture from 10 years ago and I freaked out. What if we got up every morning and looked in the mirror like we did this morning and we would say, okay, let me reflect. Did any of you see Jesus in your face this morning? Did you see it? You didn't think about it. I want you tomorrow morning or when you get in your car and you look in the rear view mirror, I want you to see, can you see Jesus in that reflection? Because the way that he did things he, he had the power to do all sorts of things. And just because he could didn't mean that he did. I, I go to the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. They brought her out to him, dropped her at his feet. They all had stones in their hands and they were ready to throw them. And they were, you know what? That particular adultery in that culture was punishable by death. She was literally moments from dying. And then what did Jesus say? He had the power, right? Huh. Oh yeah. He said, hey, if any of you are without sin, cast the first stone. You know what happened? Interesting to me. The oldest ones went away first because they got a list of data that long to prove they ain't got their act together. The young ones still don't know. They're still standing there, right? Read it. Their, their kids aren't old enough. They haven't hit as many bumps. The data sheet's not long enough yet. You understand what I'm trying to say? But they eventually all walked away. And he said, where are all your accusers? She said, they're gone. He said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. The only person, well, the person in that situation, the only one that had the power to convict her to death, and he didn't do it. It was supposed to be, the law said you had to do that. Y'all know where I'm going with this. The law said so. But Jesus said, huh, that's not how we're doing it. I don't want you to go back and live in that way anymore. I want you to quit it but I'm not condemning you. Just because we can doesn't always mean that we should. Amen? When you and I choose peace, it is the greatest sign. When we choose peace in building up, it is the greatest sign of our life and our freedom in Christ. So what does that look like in everyday life? Brennan, if you'll bring the team up. What are some areas that you know right now that you're choosing not to live out that way or, or that you don't have peace about or that you're not building, you know that you haven't built someone up in the way that you should have? I, I will tell you, I've been convicted through this text, through, through all of Romans, he brings it to us, doesn't he? Let's read verse 21. 
It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fail. Don't do anything that, will, that is going to offend somebody. Verses 22 through 23. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. In other words, don't go blabbing it around. Just keep it between you and God. Want to have a nice glass of wine on your back porch? Keep it between you and God. Don't, don't do it in front of someone that could maybe be offended and turn back to a life of addiction. You understand what I'm trying to say? Check, check yourself. Just don't be intentional. Well, it's my freedom. I can do what I want. That's not what this is saying. It's not at all what he is saying. Paul's asking us to live by faith. So whatever you believe about these things, verse 22, read with me. Keep between you and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. So whatever you do, don't live your life in a way that would violate your conscience before God. There are questions of conscience that I will tell you that someone else can do that you can't do. And you got to be okay with it. You don't want to violate your conscience before God because of what the freedom of someone else. And guess what? We don't have to give account for that person. They give their own account. You will give yours. I will give mine. I can't go in front of God on Becky's behalf. She has to go on her own. And so forth and so on. Does that make sense? You can all stand. I want to read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Here's what I want you to know. Every one of us is on a different journey in our spiritual life. That is true. But what I, don't, I, want, you to, what I want you to get is that the faith, the thing that plugs this guitar, that cord that plugs it into the amp, that's faith we got to have it. And Paul says in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, Without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone co who comes to himself, or comes to him, I butchered that. Let me do it again. Just start over. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Start over. Take two. And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Faith is the cable that is connecting us to the power source and to the instrument. Amen? And we use that to proclaim God. And we can't do it when we're fighting with each other about temporary things such as what we eat and what we drink and things of that nature. Stop it. It's a bigger picture. But do. Do, please do, follow the Holy Spirit in your life. Maybe today you say, you know what? I've done some things that I know <laughs> I have the freedom to do, but someone saw me do it and <sighs> scared I offended him. Make it right with God and ask the Holy Spirit to continue to guide you because this life, this journey is one that calls us closer in our relationship to God every single day. And that's our desire, is it not? To get closer to God I will tell you there are things that I am doing that I'm not doing today that I did as a 30 year old Christian or a 30 year old person not well you know what I mean I'll go out on a limb and say when I've turned 70 there may be things that I'll quit doing before then that I'm doing now I don't know but if God convicts me of it I will that's the journey of the Christian life we're not all going to have it all together all at one time, I promise you. But as soon as we receive Christ, the, the switch is flipped, and it's our responsibility to live out a good witness for Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Paul and his boldness to tell us how it is. <laughs> God, we thank you for inspiring him to, read, or to write this Romans, this book to the Romans, and Lord, of the analogies and parallels that we can take out of it to live our current life in, 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 in the current world that we live in. Lord, help us to be mindful of those around us. And you know what? 
Not that we would tolerate sin, but that we would love the sinner. There's a difference. And help us all to be mindful of the other person so that we don't do things in our freedom that would offend or tear them down, Lord. That we would do things that, that Holy Spirit, that you would uh, show us and convict us of the, of the way that we should live. That we would always live inside of that parameter. God, we love you and we praise you for who you are. We thank you for what you'll do for this congregation this week. In Jesus' name, amen.